Good morning, everyone. We'd like to get started on time. Would you please find a seat? Wow. I've never had so much power. <laughs> So thank you all for being here. My name is Linda Cobert. I am Research and Communications Director for the Myositis Association. And it's my great pleasure to be on stage with these amazing individuals who are so committed to research and, and treating myositis diseases and helping us move the needle on, on finding a cure. Um, so. Today's session is about, um, um, we, we will introduce these folks, they, they will introduce themselves, and then we will ask you to invite you all to ask your questions of them. And so, um, so let's get started, and um, we'll, we'll start on this end, and I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves and say just a little, you know, where you're from and a little bit about the kinds of research that you're working on. So we're missing... And, and I'm, I've been told to please um, speak directly into the mic so that everybody can hear well. Okay, and turn it on first. <laughs> <laughs> we're missing Dr. Lloyd. Um, my name is Steve Yetterberg. I am a rheumatologist and I am arguably the happiest person up here because I retired in February. Uh, hey, thanks. Um, formerly I was at the Mayo Clinic for 20 years and um, I've been a member of the Myositis um, Advisory Committee for um, a number of years and I'm privileged to be the current uh, liaison to the board of directors. Um, my activity at Mayo over the last 20 years has primarily been as a physician and care provider, but also involved in clinical research. Um, and that's all I'll say, because I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Helena Alexanderson. I'm a physical therapist and a researcher at the Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. And I'm happy to be here. This is my sixth year on the, on the board. Um, so my research focus mostly on what happens in the muscles when you exercise and what kind of exercise is feasible and safe uh, in different stages of uh, primarily adult uh, myositis. But I also am I'm interested in how can we measure uh, the effect of different treatments, uh, both when in terms of muscle function, but also a, um, looking at patient reported outcomes. Uh, and also, I'm very interested in patients' experience of uh, different symptoms in myositis. For example, pain. Um, I want to understand more what kind of pain it is and to understand how um, how the pain can be treated. Thank you. Hello, my name is Olivier Mavanist. I'm running the Myositis Center of Paris, France. Um, my training uh, is in internal medicine and clinical immunology, but I also spend some time with a neurologist in Oxford, UK. And uh, we are doing uh, translational research. That means that uh, in the team of research, we uh, look at the effect of, for instance, the youth antibodies on the muscles. And then we move to clinical trials in collaboration with uh, Andy Mamen, for instance, regarding the anti-SRP or anti-HMGCR um, 
necrotizing myopathies, and also we are running trials for inclusion body myositis. Hi, I'm Sonia Danoff. I'm actually a lung doctor from Johns Hopkins. I take care of patients who um, have uh, interstitial lung disease as a part of their autoimmune myopathy, typically polymyositis, dermatomyositis. Um, and my area of interest is really to understand what puts people at risk of the lung being involved in these diseases, um, how to identify the disease early, and how to uh, find the most effective treatments for these diseases. My name is Tay Chong from Johns Hopkins. I'm a doctor of physical medicine and rehabilitation. This is my first year on the board. I'm interested in exercise intervention and rehabilitation intervention uh, for myositis. When I say rehabilitative intervention, that includes physical, occupational, and speech therapy intervention. So I work with a team of uh, PTOT and speech therapists in my clinic. Good morning, my name is Ann Reed. I am a pediatric immunologist and rheumatologist at Duke University. I started my career really studying the genetics of muscle disease, both in adults and children. Uh, added on looking at immune cells that are in the muscle and trying to figure out what they are and what they're doing. And more recently really have looked at trying to develop ways to detect if the disease is still active. I've also done work in clinical trials and co-led the large rituximab and myositis trial that was run with Chet Otis at Pittsburgh many years ago, so I've dabbled in multiple things. My name is Kanabarina Nagaraju. I go by Raju. It's a very long South Indian name. <laughs> so I... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm at the uh, State University of New York in Binghamton. I'm an immunologist by training. I study the basic mechanisms, how muscle cell damage occurs, what are the interactions between immune cells and muscle cells. And I've been working in myositis a little more than two decades. Uh, Dr. Paul Plodge introduced me to this uh, to study myositis, and uh, uh, this became the major part of uh, my career. And, uh, I, and some of you know that I've been working for the last 10 years also to find a prednisone replacement. And uh, uh, so far, I think everything is looking good. Hopefully, in another year or so, uh, we, we, we have, uh, at least we will go to FDA to see if they will approve the drug. So we are still continuing to do the trials. So uh, 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 let's cross our fingers. We'll, we'll talk next. <laughs> My name is uh, Chris Weil. I'm at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm a neuromuscular physician, so I see patients in, uh, in our neuromuscular clinic. And I also have a basic uh, and clinical uh, science research lab where we're interested in studying mechanisms of protein degradation and protein accumulation in muscle and how that leads to muscle dysfunction in diseases like inclusion body myositis. We're interested in taking those findings and translating those to, um, to clinical care. We've become more interested recently in, uh, in trying to, as, as we start to understand these mechanisms in cells, translating them to mice, and then eventually bringing them into humans, we've recognized that there's a clear gap in just understanding how patients progress, how patients, uh, what measurements we can use to understand patient uh, changes over time, and so we're much more interested now in uh, also looking at uh, novel outcome measures in, uh, in inclusion body myositis as well as in other myositis. My name is Rohit Agarwal. I'm a rheumatologist from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've been heavily involved with clinical trials in polymyositis and dermatomyositis and trying to develop new tools which are called outcome measures on how to, how to measure um, the outcomes in our patients when they are evaluated in clinic or in clinical trials. 
What I've done lately is I'm trying to come direct to patient research uh, area where I'm trying to do more and more research um, by directly approaching the patient for research data and research analysis. And I have a study ongoing called My Pacer Study, which is uh, myositis patient-centered tele-research. And uh, I know some of you have participated in that study so far. And I'm really thankful to you and TMA for support of that direct-to-patient uh, study of mine. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andy Mammon. I'm a neurologist and neuromuscular specialist. My uh, research group is at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, and um, I see some patients there. I also am still part of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center um, in Baltimore and see patients there as well. And our, our lab group has for a while been particularly interested in myositis autoantibodies and the idea that there are you know, probably 10 or so different major myositis autoantibodies and that perhaps each of these actually define distinct diseases. We know patients have different clinical features with the different antibodies. And um, now we're really interested in focusing in on uh, what are the underlying uh, mechanisms that may drive disease in those different groups with the idea that you know, patients with different uh, autoantibodies, different diseases might benefit from, from different treatments. So that's kind of uh, one of the main things we're, we're working on these days. My name is Marianne de Visser. I'm an adult neurologist and I'm based at the Amsterdam University Medical Center in uh, the Netherlands. Um, uh, I, uh, well, in Amsterdam we have a myositis uh, expert center and my research focuses on how to uh, improve diagnostic tools and in particular uh, muscular imaging, MRI and muscle biopsy because we know it can be very challenging to properly read a muscle biopsy and we are also inf uh, involved in uh, how to uh, 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 try to get more effective treatments. We participated in clinical trials and we also initiated uh, clinical trials. Good morning, my name is Florian Ernst. I'm a rheumatologist. I work at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I'm primarily a clinician and I treat patients with dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and inclusion body myositis. I have been involved in clinical research these last few years, primarily treatment trials with dermatomyositis and polymyositis. This is my third year on the advisory board, and I'm very happy to be here and part of this organization. Thank you. My name is Mazen Damashki. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Kansas Medical Center, and I'm very delighted to be here with you. One of my privileges at the University of Kansas is that I lead, uh, by all measures, the largest clinical trials unit in neuromuscular disease in North America and we're involved in trying to advance disease knowledge and also treatments for the myositis. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tessin Mozafar. I'm a neurologist by training, a neuromuscular specialist, and I'm currently the chair of neurology at the University of California, Irvine. I've been involved in myositis research since 1995 when I started my fellowship, mainly looking at like Dr. Mammon, um, myositis antibodies and differences in the clinical picture. But <clears throat> lately we've been spending a lot of time on inclusion body myositis with the intent of doing a longer natural history study just to see how disease behaves over a longer period of time, defining new outcome measures and some biomarkers in the blood for it. Good morning, my name is Malin Regat. I'm an occupational therapist and a researcher from Karolinska University Hospital in Stockholm, Sweden. So my research interest is in hand function and how it affects the daily activities. Uh, I have also done a study on workability, which, is, I, which I think is very interesting and important. I'm also involved in a international collaboration about outcome measures that are important to the patients, patient-reported outcome measures. So that is also my interest. Thank you. 
Good morning. Uh, my name is Wael Jorjour. I'm uh, a, an immunologist and a rheumatologist. I practice at Ohio State University where I see patients with different kinds of myositis. Um, my research uh, involves uh, also a quest to find drugs other than prednisone and immunosuppressives to treat myositis. We specifically look at cell membrane that we have evidence to show that it's compromised in some forms of myositis and we are looking for ways to try to repair that. Uh, so hopefully in years to come, we'll be able to come up with some strategies to help with that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ruth Ann Vlegels, and I have the pleasure of being the dermatologist in this group. And I'm very fortunate because I get to see both adults and children with myositis because I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital. <laughs> And first and foremost, I think it's been a complete honor to take care of patients with myositis. Um, I find all my myositis patients to be extremely dedicated and resilient, and I just really think it's an honor to take care of patients with myositis. Um, I've really been involved with dermatomyositis um, since I started my training. And about seven years ago, we literally on individual patients started collecting blood and biopsy samples. And now from those uh, data today, we have a randomized controlled trial specifically for skin disease at 12 sites in the United States. So that's been really exciting. And then last, I think one of my most important jobs related to myositis is educating others. I lecture very frequently on these diseases, and I lead one of the six cla uh, courses at Harvard Medical School, and I make sure we have a full session dedicated to myositis every year. Um, because I, I bring in patients and I want every Harvard medical student to graduate knowing what myositis is, ideally how to recognize it, and also really to try to get um, young doctors interested in being myositis experts down the road. So I really am uh, excited to be a part of this group. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jens Schmidt. I'm a neurologist from Germany. I'm based in Göttingen and I'm head of the Neuromuscular Center. I think our center is unique in that we really work together in a very interdisciplinary fashion. Rheumatologists, neuropathologists, pulmonologists, neurologists, pediatric neurologists, geneticists working together and seeing patients, caring for them on a day-to-day -day basis. Our um, aims in our uh, research group are um, the mechanisms of myositis. We participate in um, international clinical trials and we develop new diagnostic tools for myositis and other neuromuscular diseases. It's my pleasure and honor to be on the board and I'm excited to be able to meet all of you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Perry Shea. I'm a neurologist at the University of California, Los Angeles, a neuromuscular specialist, a primary clinician, and I see a lot of muscle patients. I participate in cl clinical trials for muscle diseases. I'm particularly interested in clinical research as it relates to outcome measures that make us, um, that allow us to be able to uh, measure the efficacy of drugs in clinical trials, um, biomarkers, as well as clinical outcome measures. So let's go back around the circle and... Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, actually Tom Lloyd. I'm a, a neurologist and, and neuromuscular specialist at at Johns Hopkins and uh, also serve as uh, actually co-director of, of the Johns Hopkins Biocytis Center. Um, I, I uh, specialize in, uh, in the care of uh, uh, inclusion body myositis and uh, also, also run a lab uh, which is focused on um, a better understanding of, of the causes of, uh, of neurodegenerative and, and myodegenerative diseases. And uh, in particular, we're uh, uh, excited about our, uh, our current research ongoing in developing a, uh, a novel mouse model of, of inclusion body myositis. And, and uh, this work is, uh, uh, was funded uh, in part through the TMA. So I'm, uh, actually, um, you know, honored to be 
uh, here and, and uh, part of the board. Thank you to all of you. Um, and so this is the time when you all will have the opportunity to ask your own questions. I know there might be a few out there. Um, and um, so we have some people who have microphones in the audience and we will, I will go um, try and swing back and forth across the room to, to have your questions answered. Um, my, my request is that you keep things more general, not specific to your very own case. There will be opportunities later in the day after this session where you will be able to ask those specific questions in, in, a, in a smaller setting with, with an individual doctor. Um, these folks are also here after the, after the session and you, know, you can always approach them and um, ask your specific questions then. Um, I'd also like to ask you, for the sake of the rest of the questions that we might have, um, to please limit your question to one or two sentences, not a whole, you know, your whole myositis journey, although that is an incredibly important piece of who you are, um, and we want to acknowledge that, but we need to keep the questions to a couple sentences. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask the first question because I know many people in this room want to he uh, hear the answer to this. Dr. Domachki, would you mind giving us an update on the Aramaklamal trial? Yeah, sure. So, um, thanks for the question. Uh, we look forward for more questions from the audience. The Aramaklamal trial, as you know, involves 12 sites, 11 around the U.S., one in the U.K., Currently, I am happy to report to you that as of April of this year, we are fully enrolled all the subjects for the study. The study is ongoing. Uh, we're hoping that the last subject will finish in the first quarter of 2021. And after that, later on in 2021, we'll be able to share the results of the trial. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's start on this side. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is John McClellan, and I want to thank all of you uh, researchers for the work you're doing on finding uh, cures and uh, drugs that will help us with myositis. But uh, as an IBM patient, I know that I'm most likely not going to die from IBM. And this goes probably more to Dr. Chung, but I, uh, to all of you. You know, uh, what really worries me is the morbidity rate from the dysphagia uh, problems with uh, aspiration and then dying from aspiration pneumonia. And are there any trials or are you going to try to create some trials to lessen uh, the swallowing problems so that those of us with uh, IBM can live longer without uh, you know, coming to the fear of uh, having aspiration pneumonia? So unfortunately, I don't think there's any clinical trial going on for dysphagia in IBM at this point. Uh, we have uh, some preliminary studies that we submitted for publication recently, looking at the video swallowing pattern of dysphagia in IBM patients. It looks like uh, it's more associated with some muscle weakness. Uh, when we reviewed previous studies on dysphagia in IBM, there are really not many there. So I think this is an area where we really need more research on. Uh, I've been working with our speech therapists and trying to get uh, some team together for more research. But unfortunately, there's uh, any clinical trial just for this phase at this point, as far as I can tell. Maybe some other members know about this clinical trial. Dr. Schmidt? Um, maybe I can um, add to that. Um, I'm not aware of any ongoing clinical trial in IBM. Um, however, there have been um, several reports of the use of um, different 
treatment modalities for swallowing difficulties in IBM, um, and they relate to um, a myotomy, which is a one-time and irreversible treatment. Um, they relate to botulinum toxin, and they relate to balloon dilation. I agree with you that um, swallowing um, abnormalities in IBM is really a major risk for it for aspiration, and I would um, call onto all myositic, uh, myositis clinics that all physicians actively ask patients for swallowing abnormalities because um, a patient may not actually be aware that he or she has um, a beginning um, swallowing abnormality, and there are um, several scores out there that should be used um, in order to prevent severe aspiration um, further down the um, disease scores. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the scientists and physicians that you are for what you do. My question is uh, a blanket question. As a show of hands, uh, can you tell me, uh, in your uh, relation with your your uh, patients, have you ever seen a patient um, beat this thing? I am an IBM patient. That looks like a no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Depends what you mean by beat it. Not for inclusion body mice. Over here. Hi, I'm a patient of Dr. Mozafar. Right now, he's up there shaking his head, going, Oh God, what's she going to say now? <laughs> um, well, I drive two hours to see Dr. Mozafar. Last spring, I was having what I thought might be a heart attack. I had heart issues. I went to my local ER. They had never seen the likes of me. Uh, my primary care physician, I had given the TMA booklet to. I don't think she read it in the 10 years that she has had it. Certainly the ER doctors went out into the hallway to Google myositis. Um, what I need to know is, I do have IBM. I might also have a heart attack. Someday I may have cancer. I would like to know about continuity of care for those of us who are fortunate enough to have found a wonderful myositis doctor. But my own medical team, I have asked them to read the physician's handbook. Do you think if I offered them a cookie they would read it? <laughs> um, I would like to know about continuity of care with my overall medical team. Thank you. You know, this is a very tough question. I'm Mazen Dabashki, by the way. I know you spoke with me about this with Dr. Muzaffar earlier yesterday. Uh, I think the Myositis Association really is trying hard to try to come up with different ways to educate local community hospitals about myositis. As a matter of fact, in our early meeting today, Mary McGowan was describing the partnership program that Myositis Association was having to engage hospitals and knowing more about myositis, championing myositis. But as you know, as a rare disease, rare disease being less than 200,000 in the U.S., in this case, 70 to 100,000 people in the U.S., not a lot of physicians have heard of myositis, and uh, mostly they hear about diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attacks, cancer, because that's what people experience commonly. However, there's a strong need to educate, and I'm afraid that there's, this is a big challenge that we're not yet up to that goal of having everybody know about myositis. Anybody else would like to add? Yeah, Dr. So, Shea? Yeah, Perry Shea from Los Angeles. So at major medical centers, it's even challenging to get people, other, other physicians, to be able to know about rare diseases that, that are not directly within their specialty. And I think one of the benefits of being at a major medical center, of course, is the fact that they feel comfortable picking up the phone, <clears throat> emailing, calling, you know, their colleague who is taking care of uh, patients with that sometimes is 
physician who has taken care of a patient like you with IBM, um, and they'll they'll reach out to us. Um, the yeah, the challenges of smaller hospitals in the community are are is, is something that I don't think that we we've uh, figured out how to do that. We certainly want to be able to reach out and improve um, the awareness of these conditions and, and create a network that's a little bit more accessible for these physicians, but I, I don't think we have an answer to that. Although I'd say that at least they went out and got on Google to look it up. It's amazing, <laughs> you know, like our, our residents go and look at YouTube videos before they do procedures. And, and now they've been taught, but just to reinforce, to say, what do I remember? There's so much information that I, w I think I would just reiterate what, uh, what Dr. Shea said, which is I think what you, uh, at least at the, for the moment, what you have to do is encourage communication between the, the different teams of doctors, because the different teams are just going to have expertise in, in different areas, and, you know, Google's only going to get them so far. And just to reinforce that, this is um, since um, I guided, um, um, she lives in San Diego, which is not a small town by any stretch of imagination. But even in San Diego, we have challenges with that. But I think the most important thing is you can, if you have a local physician who's willing to reach out to experts and communicate, I think that's important. So that's one of the reasons I recommended a particular group to her who has had interactions with other groups in, in the country as well. So I think. Hopefully that will take care of the problem. I just want to add a comment to it, because I actually think you have a lot of control in some of this yourself, too, in that the way healthcare is moved and is moving, and some places in the country it's more like this than others, is in sort of medical homes. So it means that you have a circle of physicians and care providers, sometimes they're uh, physical therapists, sometimes they're nutritionists who have to care for you. And so it behooves your primary care physician to know you and know what's going on because they're going to be responsible for what goes on with you over time. And I think that's the power that you have just to really emphasize to them, I want to educate you. What else do you need? You know, do you want more information from the Myositis Association? What else do you want so you can help me take care of myself as well? And so I think it's a power that I would, I would really strongly recommend that you try and push a little bit. And we hope that you won't give up on trying to educate your doctors about your, your disease and, and what we know about it. Um, and you know, I love the cookie idea. <laughs> if anybody else has ideas for us, we would love to hear them. Uh, my question is regarding more IBM. Uh, what are your thoughts on boosting mitochondrial health? like taking glutathione, niacin, magnesium, NAD, anything to help repair the damaged mitochondria. I can comment on that. So, so, so there's, um, you know, whenever, you ask, whenever patients ask me those questions, those are, those are sometimes hard questions because I'm a scientist. And so I want to know, is there evidence? Has there been a clinical trial that shows that that works? Um, and so what I can say is that there's no current evidence to suggest that that's going to be beneficial. Now, if you were asked me, you know, if I was a patient or something, is that a bad idea? Absolutely not. Those are, those are reasonable things to try. There's great evidence that mitochondria are, are, uh, are impaired in inclusion body myositis. There's a good reason to think that if we improved mitochondrial health, that that would be um, something that would work. That's something we call a therapeutic target. So boosting mitochondrial health is something that, that would be a reasonable therapeutic target. What I can't say is whether, you know, what that cocktail looks like. I just don't know what that is. And so my comments to patients is if, is, if, it, if it's working, then, then, then absolutely give it a try. If someone's promising you that it's going to work, that's a different story. So if you've gone to a local physician or chiropractor who says, this is the magic you know, uh, cocktail, I would be suspicious of that. I wouldn't say not take it. I just wouldn't, uh, I would just be cautious about what your expectations are. Yeah, so I, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no evidence one way or the other. I, I don't think you're going to cause any damage. But I mean, I, I think the 
I, I agree with Chris. I mean, I think taking some supplements which are harmless is probably not a bad idea. I think you have to draw a line on the first rule is do no harm. So we've seen this in IBM, we've seen this in ALS where people have flown to other cities. I mean, there was a practitioner in Florida who used to give IV glutathione, which probably didn't do any good to anyone and probably caused more problems than that. So I think you have to draw the line somewhere and if it's costing you an arm and a leg, that's probably not a good idea. If somebody is promising you a cure or a treatment, that's probably false advertisement on that. So I, I think there, there are individual decisions there. Yeah, and then to add to the controversy a little bit, it's that the evidence in the literature about mitochondrial dysfunction in people with IBM is kind of wishy-washy. It talks about levels of enzymes in general compared to groups, but then when you look at an individual patient level, there's not established at any given age how many fibers in the muscle biopsy shows mitochondrial dysfunction. So many authorities have jumped to the conclusion there's way too many mitochondrial dysfunction in IBM when it's really not well firmed up as a fact. I just wanted to add that just because we see some abnormalities, that doesn't mean it's the cause of the disease. And so, you know, so just a. Yeah. Thank you. Over here. Hi, my name is David Javins from Seattle, Washington. Um, I'm new to this, and I have maybe a worky question, but um, I see PT on both the West Coast and the East Coast. And both uh, PT departments have told me to use light weights uh, when exercising. And at this conference, I've been given the impression that I should be taxing my muscles when I exercise to the point of fatigue. Not fatigue where I'm you know, wiped out for several days, but fatigue. So I would like some clarification on that. Dr. Alexanderson? Um, so, uh, in terms of improving your strength, you need to work with your muscle to the extent that you, the muscle is tired. Uh, so using light weight, you know, I, I introduced this Borg scale to uh, many of you. So, if you, so um, when introducing an exercise program I, to a patient, I will, so I will just test. So do 15 repetitions with this weight. And if then I ask, so how exerting was it? And so if the patient said, well, it was a one, which is like almost no exertion, very easy. So working out on that, uh, on a weight that gives you that kind of ex low exertion, it won't do any good, it won't increase your endurance or strength. Um, it's a good way to start exercising. If you have never exercised before and you maybe you're afraid of having more pain or fatigue, start on that level, but then increase as time goes by. Uh, so the goal intensity would say uh, that you work with a number of repetitions or a load that gives you a heavy exertion, five or six or very heavy exertion when you are uh, an experienced uh, exercises. When you know that this is working, you've been training regularly for, uh, for some time. So does that clarify? And it also, it depends on what you want to achieve. What is the goal of the exercise? Do you want to improve your maximal strength? For example, getting up from a chair. That is, could be a maximal effort for someone with IBM, perhaps. So then I would recommend to train fewer repetitions, but with a higher weight. Uh, if you're if you want to improve your endurance, you want to go for longer walks, you want to be able to go uphill, climb several stairs, go skiing, some, any activity that you need to do for a longer time, then I would say train on lower weights, but increase the number of repetitions until you feel that it's going to, you, your muscles have, you have to get this burning feeling, you have to have some fatigue in your muscle to achieve an actual improved muscle function. Dr. Chung, would you like to add anything? No. Well, I will talk about that. I have a Borg scale in my slide today's talk, and which will be available online, I guess. Uh, and another way to know when you stop the repetition is that if you can't really 
uh, to full range of motion, uh, that's another indication that, that uh, where you have to stop it. Thank you. Um, so the affected areas for me are uh, quadriceps, forearms, and a little bit of lower back. So what I do is I, I, I have a little bit of a different strategy. The muscles that aren't affected, I've continued to, to um, strengthen and train the way that I used to, you know, going to almost failure and everything else. The muscles that are affected, uh, what I'm doing is, is I'm doing slightly higher reps, I'm leaving a couple reps in the tank. So I'm not going to absolute failure. I find if I go to absolute failure with those muscles that are affected, it takes me a long time to recover. Um, which, is, which is, you know, a problem, right? So if, if it's an area that isn't affected, I've trained extremely heavy, high, or uh, lower reps, heavier weight, the muscles that are affected, what I've done is I've gotten a little bit less weight and I've gone to um, just short of failure so that I can recover. As long as I can recover properly, I feel good about that. And uh, in terms of that, I've been able to keep a lot of muscle on my body. And uh, I think the more the muscle you have on your body, um, the longer you can keep the disease at bay. It's still gonna affect you, but you can keep, be able to keep your regular activities going the way that you would want to. Thank you. I hope that helps anybody. Rex Bickers from Indiana, IBM, a member of the board of directors and a kit leader. If were, to me, the whole MAB would be lab rats, but uh, in many fields of medicine, a neglected area is healthcare research, utilizations, and outcomes. Let's take a chronic disease like diabetes. It's been shown pretty conclusively that a telephone call once a month, maybe twice a month, after hospital di discharge, maybe once a week, really improves patient outcomes to just say, how's it going? Uh, what's new? And I'm curious if TMA ought to be supporting healthcare outcomes and utilization research. Should myositis patients be getting, maybe it's just once a quarter, a phone call from a skilled nurse practitioner or I don't think it's been studied in diseases like ours, and I'm curious if somebody thinks it's a worthwhile undertaking. So, um, I really agree with you. I think that we're still struggling with figuring out how to best deliver care. And certainly there are some sentinel moments where it becomes clear that we need to deliver more care. Um, after a patient is hospitalized, even if they recover from what the acute event is, um, my sense is that we really need to have more, more hands-on, more touch after that. And so um, there's, at least as far as I know, I'm, again, I'm a pulmonologist, I'm not a neurologist or a, um, a rheumatologist. We've really tried to make sure that every patient who's discharged from the hospital is seen within two weeks. And you know that's a challenging thing to do, but we found that it's, it sort of helps us make sure people have gotten back on track. And I can imagine that for many patients, having that kind of brief follow-up if things are not going in the right direction could prevent them from being readmitted to a hospital. So I think it's a wonderful idea and I think it just speaks to one of the areas that there's just a desperate need for more understanding. Thank you. Um, I think we're over here. Thank you. Um, I want to direct this to the physician, a clinician, who mentioned a subject that um, he was doing, looking at medication or developing other medication other than a traditional medication that's being used to treat myositis. And if that's the case, would this prospective medication be more effective, better tolerated? And if so, do you see yourself accomplishing this in the very near future? Maybe I misunderstood the question. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to whom would you 
Okay. So, so it's always as a researcher, I have to be very responsible and not raise hopes if the hopes are not to be placed in something. But obviously, as a scientist, I have to put hope in what I'm doing, or otherwise, why am I doing it? Why am I working so hard to try to do something? So, so it, it, these, there's a lot of people who try lots of different things, and unfortunately, they don't work. But at this point in time, this is a, a promising new approach to look at, at myositis and uh, uh, muscle disorders by trying to find a way to repair this a cell membrane so that it prevents that from contributing to further damage. Uh, if you're asking me in the near future, I would say definitely not the near future. Uh, we basically, this is something that has to be tested in the laboratory on many levels and then can maybe down the road translate into something useful for patients. So again, it's, it's exciting but uh, not anytime soon ready for, for patients. And Raghu said something, he started a quest for something other than uh, prednisone. So you're not off the hook, Raghu. <laughs> so I, I can give a brief update on Vemarolone, which is a prednisone replacement. So one of the good things that prednisone does is it works, but it has terrible side effects. So s some 10 years back, uh, we started working on how can you separate these two properties, the good properties of prednisone and the bad properties of prednisone. So in order to do that, you have to understand how the bad properties come and how can we block that. So I think we, a series of experiments done, we show, we reduce significantly the bad properties of prednisone but we still retain the good properties. As Dr. Jarud mentioned, this is a process. So we started initially in the lab and then move into animal models, then move into patients. And before going to the patients, do uh, trials to see the drug is safe in normal volunteers. So this process now, the drug has been tested in children with the Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So now we are doing what is called, the FDA requires something called as a randomized blinded trial. That means the patients don't know what they are taking. So after they complete the trial period, you assess whether the drug is really working or not. So we are almost there and hopefully the results, we don't know the results yet. So by next year we should know. How long was that journey, Roger? So normally yeah, it took us a uh, little more than 11 years, this entire process. Thank you. I thank you. Um, I'm listening to everything and, and um, great strides seem to be made in what we're going through. But I want to circle back in to one of the questions that was asked earlier. Um, we're fortunate to be able to see some of these brilliant physicians, therapists um, on, on a bi-yearly basis, annual basis. But I think it's very, very important. Um, a lot of us have problems. We see community doctors. You've got commun communication and collaboration. Fortunately, currently, I sit on one of the national boards of the American College of Healthcare Executives, and we do have communication and collaboration amongst the hospitals and healthcare leaders. Uh, I know that frequently we have, as patients, we have charts. Uh, electronic medical records are now uh, across the board. There is a tremendous problem with collaboration and communication with uh, you know, EMR and HIE. Is there any way that we can set up a national registry for myositis patients? Is there a way that we can collaborate through our EMRs, giving authority to our doctors that 
um, other hospitals will be able to, if we have an urgent problem, other hospitals will be able to recognize. So I think the idea of national registry is, uh, is already out there. Europeans are doing it. We just don't have a very good national, re any national registry in U.S. and Canada. And uh, I try, I'm trying to lead some efforts to develop national registry of myositis patients across U.S. Uh, that will involve, you know, you know, 50 to 60 centers in U.S. Um, which takes care of myositis patients. So I think that's already in work. Uh, obviously, to do any work, you require funding. And that's where we are having some challenges there. Uh, but I think this idea is excellent because that, that's actually going to benefit researchers, patients, and everybody. Uh, but I think what you were also talking about is some way of cross-communicating uh, not just for national registry for research, but more for national registry or um, uh, sort of a communication between de various different EMRs. And I know there's a lot of work in progress in that area where EMRs can talk to each other. So in other words, if you're seeing a community rheumatologist, dermatologist, or a neurologist, and you come and see me, I don't have to get your chart. I can just go in your EMR with your permission and review what have what has gone through. Or opposite would be true as well. If you go to an ER or a community doctor, they can look up what my thoughts are about you. So I think that's it's not there yet. We have to do a lot of work to get there, but it's uh, it's in process. Dr. Reed, me, I just. Um, I know there's two components to that. One was the EMR talking components, and so there are a lot of systems that people have gone on that do talk, and you can see you can see records in many places. The problem is with these two big systems, the two biggest systems in the U.S., where most people are on, they don't fully communicate, and so that's been hard. And so they have tried to do a lot of national work to allow things like medication. So all the pharmacies are on one communication system, so they can tell when you renew your medications that you renewed it somewhere else before and what the timing is. And so it isn't always a black box. And so more and more people are getting there. We're just not there. I want to comment on the whole registry. So I am a pediatric rheumatologist. And one thing we have been able to accomplish, not fabulous yet, but but I think we've moved forward, is to have a uh, registry around um, many pediatric autoimmune disease, juvenile myositis is one. It's part of an organization that really was a grassroots organization from the care providers to say, how do we come together? And actually, every child that has juvenile myositis, we also do with lupus and arthritis, but every child that's diagnosed in the US, how do we put their information into a registry format? Um, it's taken a huge amount of work. It's been 20 years in the making, but we actually have it. And the beauty of it right now is if you're able to contribute, not everyone can contribute the information, but if the patients are willing and we're willing, we now can have in a year a thousand patients with juvenile myositis in this database. So I'll have a question. I can query that database and ask a question. If I can find out how many patients have some unusual side effect, you can query that information and start getting that information back. We've also even tried to go a step further and actually have a large tissue and sample base. So when people want to ask biological questions, they can then apply. Um, for samples to be able to answer a question and not have to wait 20 years to build their own data system. So it can be done. It's not easy and it's not cheap. Thank you. Back here. Yes, uh, in inclusion body myositis, we know that the inclusion bodies are made up of different kinds of proteins, P62, amyloid, uh, whatever. Do we know, or, or are there any studies to show if there is a connection between the type of inclusion body and the severity of disease or maybe prog uh, a prognosis? Um, and also, I think I forgot the last part of the question now, but any, anyway, that's the big thing. And we know that, that MHC1 uh, is upregulated. Do we know why? And do these findings, do the type of uh, inclusion bodies affect uh, the drug, perhaps a drug trial? Does a drug work better in somebody who has P62 versus amyloid? So, 
so, so I think you're asking absolutely the right question, which is, um, can we understand from current clinical information, so we're talking about looking on a muscle biopsy, whether a patient has prominent inclusions or aggregates, and, and whether that predicts somebody to have a different disease, meaning they might progress more rapidly or more slowly, whether that means they might respond to a different type of medication, perhaps a medication that focuses on a certain protein that's accumulating versus a, a different type of medication. So I think those are absolutely the right questions to ask and answer. And, and all I can say is we're thinking about those, but I don't know the answer to those yet. And so often I think, uh, when I think about those types of questions, I think about how do I take a rare disease and now I'm gonna make it more rare because I'm gonna put you into four different categories. And so in some ways, it's, it's, it's daunting to start thinking about that. As far as the connection between the immune system, so MHC class one is an immune, medic, uh, immune molecule that's upregulated on muscle fibers and the connection between the immune system and why we see protein inclusions in skeletal muscle, that's also a, a mystery um, and something that we're actively trying to understand. But, but you're asking the absolute right questions that, that we as researchers want to, to understand. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Chris mentioned about MHC class 1. This is what is, for some of you who don't know, it's called Major Histocompatibility Complex class 1. So these are the proteins that almost every nucleated cell in the body makes. The major purpose of that protein is, you know, when viruses or bacteria go inside the cell, they hide, they, they pick the piece of the hiding bacteria or virus, show it to the immune system outside, that somebody is hiding inside, this is how they look, so that the immune cells can go and kill that cell that is infected. But the problem we have in my site is, we truly don't know any bacteria or any virus inside because people tried hard to find one, but there's essentially none that is unique to my scientists. So th what we think, it is, it's body's uh, stress response. Any time we are exposed to, so for example, you don't need anything for a messy class one to go, even a crush injury is enough the class one goes up. That is kind of a sensor that some damage is happening and you alert the immune system. In my scientists, as the question is again, what causes, we don't know, the answer we don't know. But what is happening, it creates a self-sustaining loop. All the time, body in the muscle is under stress. It is telling the immune system there is something going on and the immune system is becoming active. So it's a kind of a self-sustaining loop. So I, I just wanted to make a, big, a so quick comment about that. So I think Chris answered the question about the protein aggregates and the disease behavior. One of the things that we've been trying to study is the, uh, try to answer the same question but in relation to the inflammation. So is there a difference in disease behavior, disease severity, in, uh, in response to either the antibody or the different types of lymphocytes, uh, atypical lymphocytes in the blood. So some of the studies that we are doing right now are trying to answer that question. But as Chris said, the relationship between inflammation and the degeneration or the protein accumulation is not really clear. And what we don't know yet is which is the primary phenomenon whether it's the inflammation that comes first, whether it's the degeneration that comes first, and that remains a big mystery at this point. Dr. Schmidt? Um, sorry, um, uh, it's, it's already uh, multiple answers to one question, and there are more um, questions coming up, but still, uh, um, I don't want to um, keep quiet. Um, just two more um, pieces to add from my side. Um, the, the link between MHC and the protein degeneration 
is the protein recycling machinery, which is called autophagy. In addition to um, what um, Raju said, um, is the MHC1, there is an MHC class 2. And interestingly, <clears throat> this MHC2 has been shown to be linked to inflammation and the degenerative part of IBM. And now I'm bringing this up because there might be some light at the horizon because there, have been, um, there has been a study with rapamycin which targets exactly this protein recycling machinery. And there is currently an international effort to mount um, a subsequent larger trial in IBM. So maybe this um, would be of interest. Um, and then um, just in addition to uh, what Dr. Um, Osafa just said, in terms of the henna question, what comes first, inflammation of, or degeneration, um, the um, information in the international literature so far has shown that there is several lines of evidence that inflammation can drive degeneration, whereas there is no information so far available that the reverse might be true as well. There is no information that degeneration can drive inflammation. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just very quickly, not to belabor this, but uh, our paper from 2016 uh, shows that link where degeneration can drive inflammation. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, my name's Ron. My name's Ron Hendrickson. I'm new to this, and um, our uh, care team trying to be very helpful. Uh, not familiar with this, and uh, a number of things have surfaced that we're curious about. Our uh, primary care specialist, our physical therapist, has said, "Look at anything that enhances cellular function." And the four things that have come up are hyperbaric oxygen, things like the Myers cocktail, acupuncture. Uh, and I'm very curious, oh, and cold laser therapy, I'm very curious, is there any data that any of these things which are supposed to enhance general cellular function, A, are either harmful and contraindicated or maybe helpful? Everyone agrees there's no cure and this isn't going to make that fundamental difference, but it might slow the disease or en en enhance uh, your current status. So we're very curious if there's any data either for or against any of those things. Dr. Lloyd, can I ask you to try that one? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you for uh, giving me that very, very challenging question. Um, so so uh, the answer, I, I think, is uh, in, in my situs in general, there's uh, you know, you know, not any data that I'm aware of, of uh, any of any of these alternative uh, you know, therapies like um, you know laser hyperbaric oxygen uh, acupuncture massage etc um, in in uh, general my feeling is is uh, sort of like with uh, any supplement like a uh, antioxidant if it if if there is uh, any theoretical evidence that it is uh, is possibly helpful if the actual risk of harm is extremely low and, and the cost is not uh, uh, in um, any way prohibitive, then I'm, I'm uh, certainly in favor of, of uh, trying uh, sort of experimental alternative therapies. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of evidence out there of, of the power of uh, uh, Actual positive thinking and and a placebo effect is is real. So so if if there's something out there that um, you're interested in trying that you've you've read about, uh, others may have um, actually told you they think uh, is beneficial and and it's safe. And um, I, I I I'm of the overall opinion. Why not try it? So I just want to add something. Um, so there is one randomized control trial in, of exercise in IBM. So the control, the group that exercised increased muscle strength a little bit. It wasn't a significant change, but it was 
definitely a sustained muscle function. Uh, to compare with a non-exercising control, control group that actually declined uh, during these 12 weeks. So um, I'm pretty convinced that doing regular exercise, being active, um, helps you to sustain your function uh, with IBM. And I think the only way to become stronger is to actually put mechanical load on your muscles. Um, thank you. I'm sorry, in the back. Hello, I just want to know, as a minority and a person of darker skin, how can we raise awareness in or educate physicians across the border of myositis symptoms in us? Because as we know, we have different an antibodies, and I was like misdiagnosed, and I had the overlap symptoms, and it was hard to do that. So how can we raise awareness with physicians for minorities and saying, oh, they have myositis? Because on the internet, you don't see any pictures of individual mitositis of darker skin. You just see Caucasian or Europeans. And that can be difficult. We need to be raising more awareness for minorities to discover those symptoms. Well, uh, m let me start by saying that TMA ha spent the month of May, Myositis Awareness Month, do, trying to do that exact thing. We had a campaign with a, a wonderful group of advisors from, from our um, support groups who um, helped us to develop a, an, an awareness campaign um, about myositis in women of color and the differences that, that they experience. We've got a handout um, on our resource table if anybody's interested in it, and it does have women of color all over it. So, um, and if you, um, if, and those of you who are here can pick one of those up and take it to your doctor and, and start there. And I'm sorry, this is Miriam Young, just to add to that. It was a really successful national campaign, as Linda said. We'd reached over 5 million people. We had 11 published articles throughout the nation. Um, and so what our plans are is to continue that effort, uh, of course, throughout the year, but with another uh, significant emphasis on this upcoming Myositis Awareness Month. So thank you very much for the question, because uh, as we know, um, women of color are at highest prevalence for PM and DM, and it's critically important uh, that we raise awareness about this both at the clinician level and the uh, patient and uh, families levels and thank you. Thank you, Mary. I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I absolutely agree with you and I think that the TMA has been amazing in raising this level of awareness. And I think it's like a lot, what a lot of people have said is, um, you have to, because everybody is cared for by a different provider, um, it's really important for you all to, to help educate your doctors. I mean, I think in business they call it managing up. It's the idea that, you know, you're, you're bringing back unique information. I love the person who said that they brought the myositis 101 and they're going to give it with a cookie. I mean, you really also need to help educate both your doctors, your community. Um, I have patients who go to um, rehab, they educate other patients in rehab. I mean, this really is a community effort. It isn't going to be just the TMA educating people or, or the doctors who are up here or other doctors educating people. You all are the most powerful spokespeople, and so your ability to go back and say, hey doc, you know, I, here's what I learned about my disease. You know, I think that doctors want to provide the best care they can. I think it's just there are so many different things that are coming into them. There's nothing more important than what your patient says to you. So please, please, please carry back these messages to your doctors. I, I just want to add to it. So one of the ways the doctors get educated is through research, and then their research becomes medical 
goes in the medical books. Um, so I would appeal to the to the people of minority community to really step up for research as well, because most of the research when I read and review is about uh, Caucasian populations. So I think there is a need uh, for us as a researcher to enroll, preferentially enroll people with color, and also for people with color to actually participate, volunteer for more research. Because if the research goes in, then you will see those same pictures and same education going in the medical textbooks and go from there. Thank you. Over here. Okay, um, question about autophagy and you know the misfolded proteins and things. I know that some of the intermittent fasting and the you know time restricted eating, 12 to 14 to 16 hours between you know your last and your first meal, is supposed to help with autophagy. Has any of this been studied with any myositis and um, if that helps the autophagy a little bit? I mean, because we don't really have a cure right now, and you know, if we can do things with exercise and that to help hold it back a little bit, I think that's the goal for those of us who are looking for something. Right. So, so I'm going to give the same answer I've given many times, which is I don't know the answer for sure. <laughs> However, I, I think you know there's good reason that autophagy, which is uh, you know Latin for self-eating, so it's basically how a cell recycles damaged proteins or damaged organelles within the cell, so it's basically the trash system in the cell. And the hypothesis is, is that in inclusion body myositis, that there's an accumulation of trash that can't be disposed of. And so the hypothesis, again, would be that if we increased autophagy in skeletal muscle, that that might be therapeutic in some way. And that's a reasonable thought. And the ways to do that can be through a lot of different ways. It could be through giving certain drugs. So one example is, is uh, the drug we heard about earlier, rapamycin, where rapamycin might <coughs> stimulate autophagy and be beneficial. Another is, as you said, caloric restriction, so um, intermittent fasting. The, the issue is with caloric restriction and intermittent fasting is I don't want to cause anyone any harm. And so a lot of patients will ask me, well, maybe um, it, it's known that if you have a high-protein diet, you actually inhibit autophagy. Well, it's also known if you have a high-protein diet, you build muscle. So I just can't answer that question at that point, but I can say that we are looking into those questions and trying to understand them. And I think this therapeutic trial with, with rapamycin, which is being done um, uh, Overseas and maybe Olivier can comment on the on the results of it um, is is very exciting to see if this is uh, to kind of answer the hypothesis to actually answer that question. So, uh, rapamycin in our hand on 22 patients compared to 22 with a placebo after one year of treatment shows some stabilization of the disease in terms of six minute walking distance, which remain exactly the same for the patients under rapamycin and which decline for those under the placebo. And also, we perform some quantitative MRI to quantify the, the fat replacement of the muscle. And we can observe the same kind of results, stabilizations under rapamycin and an increase of the fat within the muscle in, uh, in the patients with the placebo. So I think that's the first interesting signal with a molecule for IBM, but we have to reproduce these uh, uh, good results in one other cohort of patients. Thank you. Over here. Thanks everybody for being here. I, my question is related to clinical trials and the role of the six-minute walking test in, in clinical trials and what are the pros and cons of using this test, uh, given the heterogeneity of IBM disease and, and you know the aff affection of probably certain quadricep muscles and other ones, and how you guys see this moving forward as an endpoint, primary endpoint for some of the future clinical studies. Dr. Devisser, can you? Um, yeah, 
I think that's an important um, point, and um, there has been um, a large trial that has been published um, just very recently that failed in IBM um, with Bimagmap, and that trial used the six-minute walk test as primary outcome. And um, I think it is very important to choose an appropriate and the best possible outcome um, for any um, trial, including IBM. At the moment, I think um, it is um, difficult to provide a final answer to that. My personal opinion would be that there are other outcome measures that um, could be potentially um, more appropriate than the six-minute walk test, and one of them would be, for example, the IBM FRS, which is a functional composite score of different functions of the um, hands, feet, um, and the general well-being and um, the um, everyday um, capability of living. And this has been validated for IBM, and that could be used for future trials in IBM. And um, I, But I think that more research would be needed um, as we go for subsequent trials. So one of the intentions of the long-term natural history study that we are planning, and it's a 13-site consortium that we have put together, would be to study all of these measures in the long term, in the, over a 48-month period. Because I think the concern is that IBM FRS, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, six-minute walk test is not sensitive enough. It's been shown by the Nationwide Children's Hospital Group that of all the measures, the, the six-minute walk test has the least sensitivity in terms of detecting changes. There are other tests like time get up, which is a measure of your proximal strength, IBM FRS, you have the stair climb. So I think the problem is all the data we have is 12 months. Whether it's coming from the Bruma Grumab study, whether it's coming from the phase two of the Aramoglomal study, we don't have data beyond 12 months. So it's very important to collect this long-term, longitudinal data on how they respond, but also try to stratify it is uh, is all IBM the same disease? Are the IBM differences based on biomarkers, based on maybe, as somebody suggested, protein aggregates? I think there are questions that are still left. So uh, I would answer the question in saying that we don't know what the right measure is right now. Um, I, I'd like to, to add the, the following. Um, um, most of the patients with IBM have severe difficulty with, with walking, but there are also patients in whom uh, swallowing difficulties are the, the most important problem, or a hand function. And that is not uh, being captured by a six-minute walk test. So uh, um, my feeling is that we should include other uh, out outcome measures, like, for instance, a, a swallowing questionnaire, or specific tests for uh, for hand function. Thank you. Over here. Um, yes, I have probable IBM with PM Cox. Um, I was diagnosed in January of 17, and last October also diagnosed with carcinosarcoma. So I went through surgery and chemotherapy. Um, my neurologist um, is urging me to do a methotrexate. Um, for the IBM, and just curious if there's um, any caveats. In my case, um, I'm scared to go back on it. Chris, do you want to take this one, or do you want me to take this one? Mm -hmm. Can't you take it? Okay. <coughs> since, since we both come from WashU, and, and WashU was responsible for this entity of PM Cox, so, so I think the issue comes up is that there was a syndrome that was described about almost 20 years ago um, where the patient had inflammation on the muscle, they had Cox negative fibers on the, on the muscle, um, but they did not have the rim vacuoles or the inclusion and this entity of PM Cox um, was described. I think the feeling, at least in the community, is, um, and this is corroborated by the fact that a lot of these patients also have the anti-5C1A antibodies, is that this probably is IBM and not a separate syndrome uh, on that. Now, Todd Levine and, and Bastron had suggested that methotrexate 
may stabilize some of those patients. But I think in general, the consensus right now is that methotrexate probably doesn't make a difference um, and probably should not be recommended at this point. Thank you. I was wondering, how important do you think it is to have an MRI before a muscle biopsy? And do you think that just like any general pathologist should be able to read a my, uh, muscle biopsy, or would you recommend going to like a myositis center for that? So I, I can, I'll take this. So, so I, I don't think an MRI is required. So I think that thoughtful decision making on what muscles they're going to choose is what's required. And if the physician needs an MRI to make that decision, then, then maybe that's what they need. But, but you typically, if, if the physician is thinking about the patient and, and makes a decision on what muscle based on perhaps electrodiagnostics, so sticking the EMG needle in, that might help them understand a muscle that's affected. Sometimes an ultrasound can help, but I don't think an MRI is, is required. I think what's required is a physician that's thinking about, well, I think this would be an appropriate muscle to choose. I do think that just as we go to a specialist for certain diseases, there are specialists in certain pathologic uh, uh, features as well. And so a community a uh, pathologist who hasn't read a lot of muscle biopsy, there's actually specialists in muscle biopsy pathology, should be the one that looks at the muscle biopsy. In addition, many people don't realize this, but just like you can get a second opinion by seeing a physician, you can actually get a second opinion on your pathology. So often what we'll do is we'll have uh, somebody send their muscle biopsy to us and we will reread the muscle biopsy. We'll, we'll read it just like we would read a normal one and, and issue a report. And also what we occasionally do is if the studies weren't done in a way that we think they should be done or if there's extra studies that need to be done, often we will actually ask for the piece of the muscle. So another thing people may not realize is that if you have a muscle biopsy, your piece of the muscle is often maintained at the same site where you actually had the muscle biopsy done. And so we'll get that piece of muscle sent to us and we'll reprocess it. And so I, I do think that, um, that it's critically important to, um, to have a, a neuromuscular pathologist review your, your muscle biopsy. I, I tend to disagree with my distinguished colleague with regard to the first point. <laughs> Uh, uh, there are data that show that uh, diagnostic accuracy is improved by doing an MRI prior to the, the muscle biopsy. So you, uh, an, M an MRI can, can guide the surgeon to the area with the, uh, with the inflammation. And, and in particular, uh, it's very important that in, in people who uh, have IBM, who are suspected of IBM, and where the muscle of the quadriceps uh, is replaced by fatty tissue, that you are certain that uh, an affected, but not too affected, uh, piece of the muscle uh, is, uh, is being uh, targeted at. And, and with regard to, uh, to your sec the second part of your question, I, I totally agree. I, I really think that people uh, should go to a myositis uh, expert center uh, also because uh, um, specific uh, skills are required to process the muscle. Uh, let alone uh, reading the muscle biopsy, which uh, requires specific skills. Yeah, I agree. I agree, of course, uh, with um, every word that uh, Dr. De Visser just um, said. Just in addition, I think it is extremely important. I think that often is a key to the diagnosis um, that the clinician and the pathologist talk to each other on each specific case, in particularly. Um, in the field of myositis. In some centers in the world, it's the same person reading the biopsy and treating the patient. That's ideal. But if that's not the case, then at least there should be um, a center where the pathologist and the clinician um, works very closely together. So I would <clears throat> sort of re-echo the comments about second opinion. So there's this notion, at least in pathology, 
that you have to have rimmed vacuoles to make a diagnosis of inclusion body myocytes on muscle pathology. And that may not always be the case. So there are other features that you can look for to make a definitive diagnosis, and Dr. <clears throat> Divisor has shown that in her papers as well. So I think asking for a second opinion, especially if your hospital doesn't have the expertise, is a very good idea. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of things in the U.S. are driven by the insurance more than what the patient or the doctors want. But sometimes you can be a very strong advocate for your own case and, and demand that or request that through your insurance company. I, was, I agree with uh, what Dr. Devisser said about the utility of uh, MRI and maybe increasing the diagnostic accuracy of muscle biopsy. The only thing I would add is that it's only useful if there's communication between who's ever reading the MRI and the surgeon who's doing the biopsy, or if the surgeon looks at the MRI. So just having the MRI doesn't, doesn't do anything. The person who's doing the biopsy actually has to use the, the information from the MRI to guide the biopsy. And in my talk this afternoon, I'm actually going to show an example of a patient whose muscle biopsy was read as not inclusion body myositis. So MRI was also misread. Um, so again, there is a utility of actually looking at it yourself, um, especially as an expert. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question is, is there any research or literature out there on congenital testing um, of this disease? Because I was diagnosed with dermatomyositis after having um, breast cancer. And unfortunately, my sister uh, developed breast cancer a year before me. She didn't go through what I'm going through. So I'm wondering if there's something congenital or if there's newborn testing that's being done to see that maybe there's a recessive gene or something that's not being expressed that we could catch earlier. I can try to maybe answer this. So um, we know for, in particular for dermatomyositis, there's a link between malignancy and developing uh, dermatomyositis. Unfortunately, uh, we, and so when patients are diagnosed with dermatomyositis, in particular those with, with the specific autoantibodies, we test very carefully. But the vast majority of patients with uh, malignancy never develop myositis, obviously. We don't, we don't know what makes, uh, what's special about patients with malignancy that, that causes them to develop myositis as a, as a reaction. So there's no, you know, when someone's diagnosed with cancer, there's no particular test uh, that we can do to see if they're vulnerable to, to developing myositis. Does, it, does that answer your question? No, I, I mean like before, uh, if, it's, if it can be detected before the patient develops myositis, then it's more likely to happen. No, so we don't, for, the, for, for these diseases, um, we know that there are genetic risk factors, but the vast, vast majority of people who have those genetic risk factors will never develop myositis. So it's not like there's a test we can do and say, um, you're going to develop myositis later in life, or even um, that there's a very strong chance that you will. We can only say you're at slightly increased risk compared to everybody else. There are genetics, though, for breast cancer. And depending upon what they are, they can be sometimes checked in families that have a high risk. They will sometimes check people when they're younger. But as part of newborn screening, um, with the rarity of all this, it probably would not be something that would be put on a newborn screen. They're usually things that are either much more common, like hypothyroid disease at birth, or something that has such a grave impact that they have to catch it early. Thank you. Over here. Uh, hi. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to Dr. Vlugels. Your um, YouTube uh, talk about sun protection for people with DM was very helpful in specific ways. Um, so I thank you for that. <laughs> um, Welcome. I, Thanks it, for watching it. <laughs> yeah. You, you said uh, to wear you know the sun protection clothing uh, even if you're just going from your car to the to the store, and uh, I'm that sensitive, I need that, so thank you. 
And then my question is about antibodies. I, I have mixed connective tissue disease with DM, lupus, and psoriatic arthritis. And um, when I try to read about anti coup antibody, I see P70 and P80, but it seems like only if you're a physician can you take it any further. I, I, I'm, I'm not able to read up on that. Could you give me some advice on where to find that and how do I figure out whether I'm P70 or P80? So Olivier is published on this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Benveniste. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, um, I can't see exactly your question. Could you? No. There's very little written ah, on okay. antibodies, you? Okay. but Dr. Bonveniste has a paper on it. Yeah. I think that yeah, it's very rare, first. Um, and the, mainly, when you have a myositis with this kind of autoantibodies, you, 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 you have a risk to have a, an, interstitial, an interstitial lung disease in association. Saying that, um, the treatment is almost the same than for the other myositis, and there, there, there are no particular risk or problems for the treatment. Thanks. Over here. My question is two parts. I'm wondering, um, with IBM, is part of the progression of the disease a failure with your GI system um, in both areas? And also, if anyone has, um, what's your thoughts of using the Pilates reformer as a form of exercise? Um, so there are no studies on specific Pilates exercise for uh, myositis, but I think um, that that form of training uh, could be really useful because if you have strong core muscles, then the chance of getting more power into your arms and your hands uh, could improve. Um, was there a I think you said something about dysphagia as well. I, I don't know. GI. GI. Um, I don't know. Okay. So uh, there's not a whole lot that is uh, uh, actually known um, about the uh, actual microbiome uh, in terms of the you know underlying bacteria that. Uh, you know, normally live uh, in your gut, and uh, any form of uh, of myositis. Although, uh, ac actually, that's a an ongoing uh, and and uh, and a very active area of uh, of research. So I, I I think in the future we'll uh, uh, you know learn more. Thank you. Agree. Okay. I want to add something about Pilates. I think a lot of people ask about it. I think Pilates is a very good core uh, strengthening exercise, but there's a principle in exercise medicine where it's uh, called specific adaptation to impose demand, where uh, you are only strengthening the muscles that you are training. So, uh, you know, IBM uh, also affects distal muscles like finger flexors. And if you're doing just doing Pilates, it's not going to improve your finger flexors. So you have to be kind of wise about what you're training. I'm sorry. We, yeah, we. Yes, I'm Janine Arp, and I'm from Southern California. And I was diagnosed with DM in 2007. There's been a lot of talk about educating our doctors, and I've been doing that. Now we need to go bump it up, um, medical groups and insurance companies. I was approved last fall to go to the UCI clinic, and um, Cigna Insurance approved it, but the medical group then denied it. Um, so I think there's some education that needs to happen that talks about 
going to these centers where you have multiple disciplinaries looking at you. Um, I was referred back to a neurologist in my group who previously had said I had nothing going on. So um, how do we educate medical groups who are holding their doctors accountable and saying, you're asking for too much treatment, so don't do it anymore? I think that's a great question. I'm not sure we... So we struggle with this all the time, um, and especially in California where, unfortunately, there is a very large uh, percentage of capitated or um, HMOs um, or, um, or insurance, restrictive insurances. And it's, it's a source of great annoyance for us. Like, for instance, we get referrals from Kaiser, but they would only allow a consultation. They won't allow follow-up. And oftentimes, we will get a message back saying that we think our in-network neurologist or in-network physicians can take care of these patients. They wouldn't have referred the patient to us in the first place if they, the in-network people could have taken care of it. Um, but again, it's a fight. Um, and what I would recommend is between your physician's uh, office and yourself, and a lot of insurances have case uh, management staff that will that are supposed to help your case. So uh, what I would recommend is to figure out if you have a case manager that can be assigned to your case and put up a strong argument of why you need to go to a tertiary care referral center. Obviously, it's all about money. They're in the end, they're trying to save money. Uh, I would refer to a case manager who works for the medical group that's denied it. So that's about the part of the signal, the umbrella group said, yes, fine, you see that she's been struggling for 12 years, and maybe it's time that we take her to a doctor that has no patients in their class. And, but the medical group went so far as to <laughs> tell my GP to send me to another GP. So can I also just put a plug in for TMA and its advocacy or um, arm? You know, what I have come to realize um, uh, being in Baltimore, which is down the street from Washington, is that actually our politicians can do a lot of things. And so the other thing I would do if you don't get satisfaction with your insurance company is I would call your representative to Congress. Because every once in a while, they can make an appropriately, uh, an appropriately pressured call to someone else that may actually change outcomes. So, you know, advocacy really is supposed to help you. Your government's supposed to help you. Don't hesitate to reach out to your local representatives. And typically, it's your congressman is who you want to reach out to. Thank you. Um, I'm Martha McClintock. Um, inclusion body myositis and this is my first conference as a patient and thank you all I really really appreciate it and certainly appreciate the hope you have uh, doing research and I also appreciate the hope that everybody has that I've met but I'm someone who copes by knowing what to expect and I've been trying to find out about the course of end stage inclusion body myositis, what kind of caretaking am I going to need, what kind of resources should I put in place, where should I think about living, how do I find out what kind of uh, retirement community or assisted living facility is specific for my kinds of needs, and I'm pretty good on the internet, and I've only found one research article on this out of Holland. So maybe the people in the room don't want to hear about it, but I want to hear about it. And I'd really like to know. My physicians in Chicago uh, don't know, and because they're so hope-filled and treatment-focused, they and their staff don't want to talk about it. Thank you. Any, any well, <clears throat> I'll probably start this. Um, so I think it depends. Uh, I see a lot of patients with IBM who's more towards, well, I don't want to say end stage, but who are advanced and who are in the wheelchair. And there's a lot of problems. Uh, so it's not just about going to the wheelchair, 
Uh, if you have a limited mobility, it limits your, uh, you know, bowel and bladder function, going to the bathroom, uh, you know, rolling yourself in the bed, getting around. There's a lot of other problems. Uh, but it, it, there's no one service or one kind of service that's going to address everything. Actually, people are so different. It depends on your uh, family support, uh, how many, uh, like whether you have family who can support you or whether you need some kind of a, a visiting nurse service. There's actually a lot of different kinds of rehab service uh, that can address all different kinds of disability. Um, so uh, it doesn't really depend on diagnosis per se, uh, but if you have a good uh, rehab specialist or social worker on your community, uh, they really have to see you, uh, your home environment um, and your level of disability and what are the things that you need and depending on the resources in your community, they can come up with the different things. Well, I'm gonna have to say, I do have a couple of patients who are very, very disabled um, and uh, they don't have a lot of family support. Her husband has to work full time. Um, so she's very limited. Like I was actually even thinking about service dog, for example, who can kind of help during the day to pick up some uh, like simple things. Uh, there's also another thing that I want to mention is the emotional support as well. It was very isolated. Uh, if you imagine if you're by yourself on the electrical wheelchair all day during the day, nobody to talk to, that's another uh, kind of things that you want to get some help. So there's actually rehabilitation psychologists as well. Uh, there are very specialized psychologists who can address that emotional part of it too. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate some of those points because I've had this discussion a lot. And really, it's, it's an individualized plan. And so some people stay very independent despite the fact that they have a significant amount of physical disability. You know, you can, there are you know, very advanced technologies, um, very advanced um, power wheelchairs. Um, there are mobile arm supports that can, if you can't lift your arms up, but they, there actually are electric mobile arm supports that can help you lift your arms and give you a lot of you know, hand dexterity, even with a significant amount of weakness. I mean, it really depends on your specific situation because still you're going to need, um, you're going to probably need some home nursing at some point if, you know, if, if you want to remain independent. But for a lot of my patients who have elected to do a lot of this, you know, it helps them to, you know, stay engaged with their friends and their family. And so, you know, that brings some significant amount of psychological reward. Um, some, a lot of these things are covered by insurance, but one thing that is not covered by insurance, for instance, is, you know, a van for a power wheelchair. Like, that's something that actually has to come out of pocket. And those minivans are twice as expensive as regular minivans, just because they have to be properly adapted. So these are very individual type um, discussions, depending on, you, you know, your, your specific life situation, your specific social situation, your specific, you know, financial situation. Thank you. Um, I, I think I know the answer to the question, but I'm asking it under duress from my wife who, who wants. <laughs> is, is there any evidence or are there any case studies that show IVG to be um, beneficial in dysphagia? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Thank, thank you for the um, question. So um, there have been multiple um, clinical studies in IBM using IVIG. However, all of those um, trials so far have only been relatively short compared to ongoing and recent trials, like the Bimagrumab trial for, was for one year, and the previous trials, they were on for mostly three months and the longest for six months. <clears throat> Excuse me. The only um, outcome that has been showed in one of those studies was indeed a significant improvement of the swallowing function in patients with IBM. And there have been, in addition, several case reports that the swallowing function has been improved in some of the patients with IBM. So this is the current status. If I have not this um, could be tried is an, on a single off-label discussion with the physician who is taking care. Yes. 
Does anybody know uh, about emerging therapeutics or research on emerging therapeutics for ILD, whether that be uh, MDA5-based MDA or antisynthetase? So the question is regarding interstitial lung disease, which is a pulmonary complication in some patients who have um, autoimmune ILDs. And uh, the answer is absolutely. We're sitting at the table with somebody who's running one of the clinical trials. Um, and there, in general, there have been a number of uh, recent clinical trials uh, looking at new agents um, that are approved for other indications of uh, other forms of interstitial lung disease and looking at them in patients who have autoimmune-associated <laughs> ILD. So um, one of the big trials will actually be reporting in October. So we'll have more information, and there are definitely ongoing clinical trials right now. So I think that the options are, are increasing for patients who have interstitial lung disease. Yeah, and uh, I just want to add, so we are doing a trial for antisynthetase syndrome interstitial lung disease with a drug called Abaracept. Uh, it's a pilot trial, so it's a 20-patient trial, but we'll get the, uh, we haven't finished re recruitment yet, uh, but we're hoping for some results by end of next year. Um, and also, uh, we actually use a lot of rituximab for patients, especially for patients with antisynthetase syndrome. It's been um, shown in our studies as well as other studies that actually is quite ef uh, effective for interstitial lung disease. Uh, and obviously, there are other agents that are being studied, as Dr. Danoff said, uh, in interstitial lung disease world, non-myositis, but those studies can also inform and be used, some of those drugs could be used for myositis ILD in future as well. So I think there's a lot of hope uh, for that in the future. We have time for one very short question. Okay. No, no I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, I'm we're the doing one that, our best. I'm the one that asked this question at a previous conference, but it's a totally different environment now. And the question is about CBD and the use of, of medical marijuana. We have a number of people within our support group who their doctors have been very kind of, yeah, okay, if you do it, that's fine with me. But they're using CBD for pain, for things like calcinosis, and they're using mar medical marijuana pills for helping them sleep while they're on prednisone and things like that. Any comments from anybody about the use of these products for myositis patients. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to bite. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, you've heard from the other uh, folks who are up here that we have a very rigorous way that we go through clinical trials to figure out if medications are effective and safe for different um, indications. And certainly in Maryland, where we have medical marijuana and CBD available, um, I am I'm actually um, facing this question from patients constantly. It is a drug that's come on the market that we have no experience with. I, I mean, I, I don't know what clinical trials have been done, um, but it, it has jumped out there. And, and I think that it's one of the reasons why we, um, we find this sort of a complicated situation because we want to offer what is useful and, and safe and effective. And at least from my perspective as a lung doctor, the only thing I'll say is don't smoke it and don't vape it. But, you know, and, and I think that my, my statements have been supported by what's in, the, in the, the news recently. But we don't really have any guidance because it jumped ahead of the usual clinical trial protocols and this is why they're in place. But it's a great question. I, I get asked this at least once a week. Yeah. Thank so, you. So my life is easier in California because it's now available as recreational purposes as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have to prescribe it. People can get it without my asking as well. So I mean, I think um, Dr. Deroff is right. There is, there is no evidence that it necessarily works. I mean, I know it's been, it's been sort of propagated as the cure for everything and, and treatment for everything. But there's really no data to support it. Uh, but the fact is, a lot of people are using marijuana or CBD 
Um, but unfortunately, because it's so freely available, we'll never have the kind of evidence that we need to prove whether it works or not. Thank you, and I'm afraid we're going to have to cut it off at that. Um, we need, these folks will be available outside the, the room to ask more questions if you'd like. There's also the 1130 um, sessions that, where they will be available. So thank you. Button, will you please? <laughs> <laughs>